15th Street Farm mission is education. And uh, being in the uh, downtown St. Petersburg, uh, we, can, uh, share, we can share with people uh, where our food comes from, how it is grown, and the importance of uh, the soil in uh, life on Earth. Uh, the soil microbiome is very important because it is uh, helping transform carbon into nutrients uh, that will be available to the plants and to us. Uh, and this is the basis of regenerative agriculture. Uh, we have the great opportunity to uh, have a gentleman who is a highly respected specialist of uh, regenerative agriculture. His name is Dane Terrell, and uh, he is going to explain how a living soil is uh, important for our food supply and uh, it is impacting our health. Well, thank you for everybody uh, that's here. Besides uh, Ron and I, I'll introduce uh, my wife Jacqueline in the red and then Ron's wife Dorothy in the white. Um, Ron and Dorothy have uh, been with CSI for since its inception or close to it, 1994. What we do, um, so number one is, is help educate people on the benefits of healthy soil, healthy plants. And to us, it doesn't matter if it's a citrus tree, lettuce, cannabis, hemp, tomatoes, turf grass, pastures, the same concepts apply. And each of you could argue with me until tomorrow at this time and say, no, I grow X and I need to have this much nutrition because it's a nitrogen hog or whatever. That's just, that there is some truth to that. Some plants need a little heavier nitrogen feed than others, but generically speaking from a soil perspective, we are trying to build healthy soil to support the microbial system the solubilization of minerals in the soil, what grows above the ground and the roots that grow below, it doesn't matter to me. I, I look for green plants, that's what I'm looking for, it's a green plant in the soil. Can you hear me well enough over that thing? Usually my voice is not a problem. So, um, the basis is, is I'm gonna tell everybody, I can tell you what to do, but I can't tell you specifics until I see the historical dynamics of your soil. I need to see a soil test. That's how I learned, that's how Ron learned, that's how most of us in the consulting world have learned is we need to have a map to move on. We need to have something, the map being your, your soil test. Albrecht was a uh, researcher um, at University of Missouri or Missouri State, one of those back in the 40s. And what he did was he took samples of soil from all over the world, the best producing soils from all over the world. And what he found out was that there was this basic need, foundational need, to have a certain percentage of calcium and a certain percentage of magnesium in your soil. Calcium and magnesium alone have a lot to determine from a chemistry perspective your soil structure. Your soil structure is what gives air water exchange, so we have good air water exchange for what? And you're gonna say roots, and I'm gonna say no, to support microbial activity. That air water exchange, they need the same things you and I need. They need a house, so they need carbon. They need soluble carbon to feed on. They need the foundation built from a mineral concept, from a chemistry concept, so that we have the air water exchange to support the microbes. What we've done in agriculture for the last 100 years, 75 years, is we've destroyed that soil system. We've destroyed the, the, the mineral balance necessary to, to support microbes. So then when we have that, anybody ever had some compaction in your soil? Yes, sand in Florida compacts just like anything else does. 
Um, when we have compacted soils, we don't have air water exchange. The micro, there's still microbes that live under there. Microbes are ubiquitous, they live everywhere. It's just these microbes down here are most, most likely pathogens. And that, therefore you get Phytophthora, Fusarium, uh, root rots, things like that um, on your plant. Sometimes all it takes is to get us to have a better balance of minerals in this soil to support the aerobic microorganisms and things just start to flourish as far as plants go. So first and foremost, mineral balancing. If you see our, our logo, you'll see it's actually a corn stalk. Brad has a citrus tree and it's, it's a balance. It's the old legal balance of, of minerals and microbes. We have to have balance in the system. And when we achieve balance, we can start reducing excess fertilizers that we're having to apply. We start getting better quality, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, we start getting better yields. You start seeing it on your plant. You know when you walk into your garden, into your grove, into your grow room, wherever you're growing, you start seeing these leaves that have, they've got shine to them. You can feel the energy, you can feel the vigor, they just feel better. And when you eat them, they taste so much better. The best tool we have to determine how quality the food is, is your nose and your tongue. Your nose and your tongue determine everything. And if you could walk down the produce aisle and take a bite out of that apple to decide if you're going to buy it, that would be your best device to do that. Unfortunately, the produce managers or the farm market managers don't like that very much, but that's, that's, uh, that really is a determining factor. So let me, let me back up. Um, so minerals, we've got to have our minerals in some sort of balance. What, what Albrecht was was actually a soil microbiologist. What he figured out was this 68% this calcium, and if I'm way over somebody's head on these soil testing things, just kind of bear with me. You don't have to know this by heart. That's what we're here for. I'm just giving you some, some concepts here. So the idea is in most soils, we would like to have 68% calcium, 12% magnesium for, for a total of 80%. And then potassium floats in there somewhere around three to 5%, sodium below three, and then the trace minerals below four. Uh, again, you don't have to remember all that. That's not, I'm not gonna give you an exam when we're done here today. So you're, you're safe on that. Um, so when we have the foundation built with good mineral balance, then we can start focusing on our biological system. Sometimes it will take care of itself by, do, by, uh, by getting the minerals balanced, but I'm a proponent of inoculation. So uh, what's inoculation? We're, we're trying to inoculate microbes, okay? We need to get beneficial microbes back in soils. Simple easiest, most inexpensive is to make your own compost or make your own vermicompost. Um, everybody know what composting is? The, the composting is, is uh, a soil health improvement tool, the acronym SHIT. Okay, soil health improvement tool. The reason for compost is not the nutritional component of the compost. Okay, don't go buy compost from a compost manufacturer because they tell you they have 6% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, 1% potassium, and trace minerals. That's not why we purchase compost. Compost should be purchased based on biological activity and carbon. That's, that's the value of compost. The nutrition, we don't even know how to measure nutrient profiles in compost. So here's your first lesson on microbes. When a microbe consumes nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or calcium or strontium or vanadium or whatever, and they combine that with carbon, they don't poop out nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, boron, whatever. They're pooping out a metabolite. It's just like when we eat a carrot, sorry to be so graphic, we don't poop out carrots, okay? Microbes are no different. So what they poop out is still very nutritional to a plant. A plant can actually, it's a microbial metabolite, it's amino acid, it's a protein. But to my point about compost having a nutritional value, all they're showing you is soluble nutrition in that, in that analysis. 
what's actually in that compost is all this microbial metabolite, microbe poop, that is nutrition that we don't even know how to measure. It's science today. We, aren't, we don't know how to measure these and, and really put a grasp on them. So uh, forget the nutrient analysis, the compost. It makes very little difference as long as it's quality compost. So I probably should go into quality compost. Now that you know that I'm buying, I'm, I want you to make or purchase compost based on biological activity, um, we want the, the microbes that we're looking for are a diverse um, species of, of, excuse me, of bacteria. We want fungi and yeasts. We want protozoa and we want nematodes. Those are the, basically the five areas that we really are targeting in on. Now here's the challenge. How do you know if you're gonna go out and purchase or you're making your own compost? Do I have the microbes there? You know, are all those microbes there? Even if you aren't making the best compost in the world, it's probably better than what you have in your soil to begin with. There are labs that can do testing. We do biological testing. So I can liquefy a sample of compost and I can put it under a microscope and say, yep, good bacterial to fungal ratios. We saw some protozoas, we saw some nematodes. There's also some other tests out there, um, phospholipid fatty acid tests. If you really want to get into this, we do this with large row crop farmers um, where we're trying to look at what's the balance of, of uh, bacteria and specifically fungi um, in the system. So, um, do I want to go into that or do I not want to go into that? Yeah, well, let's go into that. The reason, the reason that um, we want this, I talked about this balance of microbes. Um, most of your commercially made compost is vac very bacterially dominated. So I look in at a microscope and I just see tons of bacteria and nothing else. Is it bad for your soil? No, it's not bad. It's probably better than what you have. Uh, but ideally, we want the bacteria and the fungi there, fungi and yeast. Because in soils, in planting systems, the microbial uh, populations, the microbial diversity changes based on what crop you're growing. Microbes mediate all life on Earth. They eat before anything else eats. But they eat based on what they're living around, the tree or the lettuce. Two very different microbial biomes in that system. And that's usually um, the younger successional plants, everybody knows successional lettuces and grasses and things like that, early successional, they're going to be extremely bacterial. Uh, uh, the prairies are ext extremely bacterial. Over time, they will start moving to be later successional, which, which means more fungi. So if you're trying to grow citrus, you really want fungally dominant. Citrus, anything in the trees family, later successional plants, it needs to be more fungally dominant. So if you take a bacterial compost out there and throw it on your, on your orange grove, is that the best thing for it? Probably not, because we're really trying to build fungi in that soil. And for the same thing, don't go dig soil, fungally dominant soil out of the woods and expect it to grow lettuce greens. If you're gonna struggle, okay? Anybody have a question on that concept right there? That is important, especially when you're looking at compost or making compost. How do you make more fungally dominant compost? You add more cellulose and lignin during the composting process. So wood chips, um, shredded bark, anything like that is gonna support, feed the, the more of the fungal system. And I'll talk about that in teas in a little bit. Um, so the, the idea here when we get minerals balanced, we get biology balanced, or in most cases it's just functioning at optimal levels, and we put a plant in the middle of it. This, the plant and the, and the bacteria are the, the crux of the whole, th uh, plant and the biology are the crux of the whole thing. We want a plant on that soil 365 days a year. Even if it's not your cash crop, we want something growing because there's this wonderful concept called photosynthesis. Most of you are probably moderately aware of photosynthesis, but, but the leaf captures the sunlight and takes the CO2 and makes sugar. Sugar is carbon. Sugar feeds microbes. 
Most of the soils, especially in Florida, not here, have very low carbon content, very low soil organic matter. And just as a rule of thumb, if you get a soil test and your soil organic matter is less than 2.5%, your microbes are on a starvation diet. You cannot support your microbial system with, um, with the carbon you have there. So you have to add it. You either physically putting out fish or molasses or um, organic acids, all are, are carbon sources that feed microbes, or your plant has to be photosynthesizing optimally, we'll get into that, pumping the sugars down in the plant. Accumulated is gonna be pumped down into the roots, and then some will be pumped out of the roots. Why? To feed the microbes. The microbes are down there in the, phylos, in the rhizosphere around that root, and they're doing their um, solubilizing of the sand, silt, and clay, of the applied fertilizer, however nutrition that you got the nutrition there, and they're, they're dropping these little poops behind them, which the plant just requires zero conversion, doesn't have to do anything to. You can grab onto it, suck it up, and now it's got phosphorus or potassium in the system. Um, so photosynthesis drives the system. So how do we, you know, in, in, the, in the big picture, yes, we got to have minerals balanced. Yes, we have to have biology functioning. But now we have to have the plant at optimum photosynthesis. And that is not NPK. And I can't emphasize that en enough. That's not just NPK fertilizer. What seems to have over the last, Ron would probably say over the last, I don't know, Ron Lent, um, oh, over the last 30 years, is that our trace minerals are holding us back as far as good production more than NPK. So I'm working with conventional row crop, corn and beans. What we're doing, they're still spraying chemicals. Most of them have eliminated tillage or reduced tillage. Um, what we're doing by getting these minerals balanced, getting biology functioning in the soil, and, and getting that plant to, to uh, have optimal photosynthesis is we reduce their input cost. So instead of putting 180 units of, of, uh, of nitrogen to grow 180 bushel corn, we now can do it with 125. Well, that's profit in the farmer's pocket. And we have better quality. Um, so in a, in a tomato plant, it's no different. We have, to, we have to optimize photosynthesis because that is our feeding mechanism for the microbes. And if the plant isn't photosynthesizing, they're going to eat. They always eat first. And they're going to start using up your carbon. And when we start using up your carbon and lose your, lose your carbon in your soil, then you're going to have not as good a soil structure. You're not as good of uh, water retention. Uh, there's a million things. More weed problems, um, all, more disease problems. There's all kinds of cascading effects from, from having these, these issues. So um, we, have to, we have to kind of, when we attack, when I, when I work with a grower, I'm looking at all aspects. I'm looking at soil health from the perspective of mineral balance. I'm, uh, from biological activity and diversity, and then uh, optimizing photosynthesis in the plant. So um, in commercial production, you don't see this typically in urban gardens, but in commercial production, we use either a tissue test or a sap analysis um, to see what is actually in the leaf of that fruit or in that plant. Because then if I can see what's in that plant's leaf, and I see zinc and manganese are low, I can go out with a foliar or a drip or whatever and throw some of that fertility out, bring those levels up, and now I have better photosynthesis, which means better yield, better quality, better profit margins for, for the grower. Um, in small scale production,
broke something, Brad. In small scale production, any, everybody, anybody have one of these? How many use one of these on a weekly basis to have them? Okay, this is a refractometer. What it's measuring is dissolved solids in solution, sugar. Okay? So, for those of you doing your own production that aren't going to send off for an $85 sap or a tissue test, this is a great tool. Because what you can do with this tool is take these vice grips, and I would demonstrate it, but I want to keep moving and we could do it later if, if anybody wants to see it. Um, take some leaves off the plant, squeeze out the juice, put it on here. Ryan, if you want to do one, so and then we'll send it around. Maybe, maybe find a fruit or something. Or maybe Emmanuel can direct you there and we can send it around so they can see it for people that haven't seen it. And that's going to tell us how well our sugar production factory is working. If our sugar production factory is working, we've got a problem. It's a nutritional issue nine times out of ten. It's a nutritional issue. Um, it, they are, sugar production is, um, the plants know what the weather's going to be before the meteorologists do. So you can actually have a sugar drop or a sugar hold if, if you're going to get a frost tonight. Those plants could retain their sugars and you could get a false reading and it was at 12 on your tomatoes and all of a sudden it's at 16 and tomorrow morning it's still at 16. It just held onto the sugar so it doesn't freeze. The sugar doesn't freeze. So there are some things that you have to be aware of with doing bricks, but if you do bricks on a, on a, a say a weekly basis, every two week basis, go to the same type of plant uh, tomatoes, for example, and you test them every week, every Monday morning at 9 o'clock, you test them and you're running 12, 12, 12, 12, and then the fourth week it drops to 8. Your plant needs energy. Your plant needs something. Something because now photosynthesis, its sugar production is slowing down. If sugar production is slowing down, you're not feeding microbial activity and you're not producing the quality fruit that you could have been doing. Uh, uh, if you had optimal levels. So it doesn't tell you what's wrong, but it tells you your plant's starving. Now, we know from plant physiology, during different stages of growth in the plant, if, if, if you were testing, for example, um, a pumpkin, squash, cucumber, any of those curcumin crops, and that plant is in the fruit fill stage, so we're filling out the squash, I have an idea of where the problem lies. It's going to be potassium or manganese. So I would, if, if I knew nothing else, I would say go do a foliar potassium with manganese in it and then bricks it 30 minutes later and you should see in 30 minutes, if you got a good product, 30 minutes you're going to actually see that bump back up to the 10 or 11 somewhere in there. Get it back close to the 12. Um, and it, that's, that's all plant physiology and I don't want to bore you with all the details of plant physiology. Um, there's wonderful books on it. Um, Horst Marschner's book um, is probably the best. It's what they use in the universities for teaching. Um, that's probably the best one. But there's, there's just to put a frame around it, um, we know that there's, there's minerals uh, in the plant that are mobile minerals, meaning they'll move from the new and the old leaf. Old leaf. So we've got xylem and phloem mo mobile. And then there, there are nutrients that don't. So um, I'm not going to go into which those are because it's not important for right now. But if we know some basic things, what stage of growth you're in and know what minerals are, are uh, mobile and which aren't, we can come up with a pretty good idea of which would be a foliar spray to help move your bricks back up to the 12. Um, so that's, that's one option as a tool. That, that tool is $145. If you don't have one and you go buy one, please go buy it from Bob and Cheryl Pike at Pike Agra. Um, they're out of Maine. Are they out of Maine, Dorothy? Maine. Um, Pike Agra. And here's why. You can go buy one from Amazon for $89.95. But when you call them up and say, you know what, I just ran my bricks for the 13th time in 13 weeks and my bricks dropped four points, what do you think is going on? They probably aren't going to, they won't have the answer. If you call Cheryl up at Pike Agra, and we don't get any money for this, this is, this is they're wonderful people and they've done a great job and he was trained by Reams. Um, um, spend the $145, support somebody that's really supporting uh, what we do.
Uh, and by, by the same token, there are other meters he has available. And I'll pass these around. Um, so there's a nitrate meter there, there's a potassium meter there, and there's a calcium meter. So an or, another way that you can, as a small grower, manage your system, manage, monitor your crop, is you can take these meters and you can squeeze some juice out in the meter and you can look at where your nitrates are. You can look at where your potassium is and calcium. Those are the main three. Why do we use nitrates uh, as, a, a, as a real key? Uh, as a real key to crop health. Um, I told you I wasn't going to go into plant physiology, but I think this is a good one that everybody should know. Because this is... Oh, sorry. Okay, pH meter. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, nitrates are evil in a plant. Um, the way that plants take up nitrogen, generically nitrogen, they pull it up one of three ways. One is nitrate. So the nitrate comes through the soil by mass diffusion. It gets intercepted by the root. The root takes it up and it goes and gets put in this leaf. The plant doesn't want to function on nitrates alone. What the plant is going to do within the leaf is it's going to convert it over to amino acid, pepti peptides, and proteins. In order for that to happen, this is why mineral balance is so critical. In order for that to happen, we have to have sufficient sulfur, magnesium, and molybdenum for that to happen. And if it doesn't, anybody ever had aphids or any biting, chewing insect on their plants? You have too much nitrogen in your system and not enough sulfates, molybdenum, magnesium, could be one, any of the three. And then that's when we have biting, chewing insects. So one of the challenges in any cropping system, doesn't matter what it is, if you have a biting, chewing insect, you probably have uh, either a, a nitrate excess or a lack of sulfur, magnesium, molybdenum. And this, is, this concept in plant physiology is called protein synthesis. synthesis. When you can get a plant synthesizing protein efficiently, you're going to reduce a lot of your insect, biting, chewing insect pressures, and actually some of your fungal disease pressures too. So, um, when I said nitrates are the devil, what we really want in our soil is we want our nitrogen in an amino acid form before it ever moves into the crop. How do we do that? Biology. Microbes do that. In, in a legume, in a bean, um, the rhizobium, that's what rhizobium does in the, in the nodules. In other soil that's non-leguminous plants, then we, uh, the microbes, the bacteria, the fungi, the mycorrhizae, they change that form into a form that the plant can take up as needed. So when you use a refractometer, you need a garlic press. Manuel has a garlic press. <laughs> the most difficult thing to do is to get the juice out so if you're working with citrus and leaves of trees, you need to be able to lump on that to get it out. And sometimes you need to wrap that with like wetting veil to hold it together to, so that you can finally get a drop or two of juice out. You, you put the juice on the refractometer, it refracts the light. You adjust this to your eye and the bricks will Bricks will run from 0 to 32 or 30, depending on your unit. The higher, the better. Generally speaking, a bricks of 4 is poor. A bricks of 12 is excellent. So we were in Pennsylvania, and the grower was using our program in the 80s. And we reached down and picked up a bell pepper and it was 16. It was like eating an apple. When you have that much bricks, it's not necessarily 
all sugars, but but anyway, it, it gives you an indication of what kind of sugar level, mineral level, trace mineral level, smell level you have with whatever you're eating. When you get those bricks up, you don't want to eat as much because it's got more nutrition in it. So um, to, to follow in right there, uh, I'm going to focus on Brad and Maria um, from Turner Citrus. So Brad um, is growing citrus regeneratively, and he has been using yeah. bricks every week, as he, he'll say, both on the leaf and on the fruit. But when you bricks his, what were those that were bricks in the 19s? I don't remember. You're gonna have, you, go ahead. You can tell, tell what your, your bricks was of those. Were those... Uh, Tangerines. I can't remember what they were. Yeah, yeah, I had some tangerines that were bricks and like mid vein on the juvenile tree was typically more quality than the yellow. Know, so the average in the tree is probably 10 or 11. Yeah. So increasing doing what he's doing, which is exactly what we're helping guide him through, is he's getting his bricks levels up. Now, there are some cropping systems that are now getting paid for bricks, grapes. Concord grapes, Welch's grape juice, grapes up in, the, in, we have a lot in Michigan. They actually get paid. They won't pick their grapes until their bricks is most years 15. So if, you're, if, you're, if your crop is 14, sorry, you let them drop to the ground or find some other outlet for them because they won't buy them. Some, blueberry, um, some blueberries are doing that up in Michigan right now. You actually get a, an increase in pay for higher bricks. Um, and in reality, it's where the entire food system should be going. We all should, as consumers, be bu buying higher bricks food because higher bricks food is better for us nutritionally. And I was talking to the gentleman this morning, and I said earlier, and I said um, the way to, to feed the world by 2030 or 2050 isn't growing more bushels, it's growing more nutrient dense food. It makes sense. If we get more nutrition in our system, we don't have to eat a bushel to get full. Well, me a bushel, you a pack, okay, to get full. Because now I'm getting the nutrition. When you feel a hunger pang, it's not because you want another donut. I do, but it's, it's really telling you you need more tr nutrition in the system. So um, we keep eating more to do that. And a friend of um, Brad and mine, who's a, one, of our, one of our clients, uh, Brad sent Christmas gifts of, of boxes of fruit to out to a bunch of us and George called me up before I came down here and he said you know what's interesting he said every morning since I had the fruit I was eating a, a couple oranges or something like that and I'm full to lunch he said I ran out of that fruit and I went to the Walmart and bought whatever and now I eat the same thing two oranges in the morning two navel oranges in the morning and by 10 o'clock I'm starving and he said what's that telling me and I said the nutrition was there with his fruit. What you're getting from who knows where has that bricks of seven or eight or nine or ten. It doesn't have nutritional value of that. So, what was the bricks on the whatever you tested? What? On what was it? Fruit or leaf? Fruit. Okay, so. We've got, work, we've got work to go on that tomato. We want that tomato at 12. What, Tanio or Reams? The 12, Reams. What Reams, Dr. Kerry Reams proved is that if you, once you get your um, bricks up to 12, in most cropping systems, you will eliminate um, insect pressures totally. Why? Because the plant is now producing complex sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, peptides, amino acids, and not simple sugar. These, most of these biting, chewing insects don't have the digestional tract to process these more complex system, more complex carbohydrates. Uh, what happens is it ferments in them, they get drunk and fall off your plant, which is what you want. Okay, that's the idea, is what, that's what you want. So, um, we could go out and do a foliar right now with a manual. I'd say put uh, some fish and some molasses and, um, I don't know, azomite or something, and go out and do a foliar. We could run that bricks in 30 minutes. And if, if the bricks moved up one or two points, 
it was what the plant needed. If the bricks didn't move, it didn't need, you didn't do any good. But it's a good way for you as a grower to really determine, am I doing the right thing for my plants? And, and, and Dr. Phil and Ron, and I don't know where this originally came from, but they came up with this concept called the hula hoop method. And so basically you take a hula hoop and you, you go out and put it around, you know, six different, six hula hoops around six different tomato plants. You bricks the tomato plants before, and on the first one, you go out and foliar spray fish and, and Epsom salts. And the second one, you do fish, Epsom salts, and molasses. And on the third one, you might just do molasses. And then the fourth one, and you go back through and run your bricks 30 minutes later, whatever gave the biggest bump, that's what your plant needs. Seems complex, but it doesn't require an $85 sap or tissue test to do it. And it works. That, that, that will work. You can do that. Um, is that a question? No? Okay. Yes? Yeah, d depending on um, what... What was the question? The question was how the plant responds that quickly. Uh, it depends on what, if you're doing nutritional things to the plant. So if you're putting phosphorus on or you're putting calcium on or you're putting whatever on, number one, is that product chelated so it can actually get into the plant? Because phosphorus and calcium are very big ions. They're hard to get into a plant where... Um, other ones are smaller ions, and if they have the right chelation, which is the claw, just grabs onto it and it can go right into the tissue. Or the microbes leaving, leave, living on that leaf of the plant will actually grab onto that energy and poop it out and go right into the plant that way too. So yes, it can happen in, in 30 minutes. You can, see a, you can see an increase. Now, <clears throat> um, again, if you were using calcium or phosphorus, yeah, that's hard to hard to know. Uh, azomite, if if you had some chelation in it, yeah, I'm not saying that azomite's going to go in and as as azomite, but remember, I said before, everything, all of us are covered with microbes, and so are the leaves, and they need food just like you and I. They're eating all the time. So if you throw azomite on there, and the bacteria or fungi or biofilm yeast or whatever grabs that up and now they poop it out right, right on the leaf of the plant. So it, it's not gonna go in as azomite, but maybe some uh, derivative of that. Um, any questions on bricks? Yes? How does bricks compare to, uh, to hydroponic crops? How does bricks compare to hydroponic grown crops? If If you have all your nutrition balanced, it's no different than out here in the, in the soil, at least to our knowledge today. There's some things that happen in living soil that we probably are never going to put our thumb on because it's so dynamic a system. Um, in hydroponic, it's not typically a living system per se. I mean, there are people doing hydroponics with biology, but that becomes problems from filtering and it just doesn't work very well. And some of these metabolites that these microbes poop out, we can't manufacture. We don't know how to manufacture. So can we get better bricks in soil-grown uh, fruits and vegetables? In my opinion, absolutely yes. And if you're doing hydroponics, I'm not poking fun at anybody that's doing hydroponics. It's okay, we have people that do that. But um, it, takes, it takes the balance of nutrition. My question is, uh, I've worked in hydroponics, and you talked earlier about uh, the shine, the bigger and the energy of the plants, and something I experienced was feeling like the plants were flat. I couldn't, I couldn't conceptualize why, it's just the feeling I had is that these plants were flat. Yep. I was wondering if that is related to your bricks content. Right, so, so in stages of plant health, we have basically four stages. One is carbohydrate synthesis, basically making sugar. If you can't achieve that, go find a new career. You know, because that's that's the basis for photosynthesis, is getting sugar production. Second is protein synthesis. So we gotta get our nitrogen functioning correctly in our soil. When we get into the third one, the only way that we can get to the third one is using microbial metabolite fertilizer. 
and that's when plants start producing lipids, fats, and oils. And as you can imagine, lipids, fats, and oils are shiny. And when a plant starts, you'll see the leaf, instead of being flat, it'll thicken up, and it'll get a shine on it. It kind of smiles at you if you look at it just right. You know what I'm saying? You know, just exactly what you didn't see. And, and, and uh, my understanding from my reading and research and listening to people like myself is that it's that third to fourth stage of growth, uh, no, stage of plant health, that you see the lipids, fats, and oils in the shiny leaf. So if you're not there, then you obviously weren't getting to that spot. And there's people that argue to get to three and four, you only can do it through microbial metabolite nutrition. I don't know that scientifically if that's perfectly correct or not, but I'm not gonna argue it. But one of the challenges we have in, in our food production is our inability to really determine what is quality? What when I when I go and to the grocery store, the produce market, the farm stand, what determines quality? And and as I said before, you can't take a bite of it and taste it. You can't use a refractometer and squeeze juice out because they they get upset with that. Um, so um, there's a gentleman by the name of Dan Kittridge, and Dan. Um, lifelong organic farmer. His parents started NOFA, Massachusetts, the Northeast Organic Farming Association in Massachusetts. What he figured out when he was about 20 is he said, we're doing everything correctly. We're growing it organically. We're doing it everything right, but we're still getting attacked by insect and disease. So organic isn't always better for us, was his point. I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to put transparency in our food supply to figure out what is good for me from a quality standpoint. So fast forward after some journeys that he did on his own, is he, was, he set out to build this transparency. And this tool right here, this is the beta version, actually not functioning anymore. They've come out with a new version which is out right now. This tool right here, much like the bricks, but you just take a leaf and you put it in between here, it actually sends a light scan. And the reflection of the light scan is energy. Okay, so the energy is, comes, dependent, depending on the mineral, it's a different wavelength. And then that is downloaded to your phone, which has this wonderful data uh, set in it. And if you went and scanned uh, hippity hoppity carrots and floppy eared and bunny love carrots, three different bags at a pound, and you scan this one, it scanned and it, it, it pops a number, a number pops up. And the number says 25 for hippity hoppity, and bunny ears was 50, and this one was 85. That's the tool that's out there. It's not in full production yet, but it is going to be um, in the next couple of years. Actually, the, the version that's, that I'm waiting for right now actually has six crops on it. So we could go buy carrots using this tool, or spinach, uh, grape, grapes, uh, lettuce, cherry tomatoes and something else, I can't remember. Um, but doing the research to say, is this valuable? Can this be valuable to you as a consumer? Because we wanna know, back to those three bags of carrot, what carrot is worth, nutritionally, is worth money to us? So in their, um, in their data collection, basically what we did as collaborators is, is Dan would call us up and say, hey, we need carrots. And so we'd call up three carrot growers and say, ship your stuff to actually Ann Arbor, Michigan, to the lab. And so they started doing all these data sets. The first, two, first year and a half was just spinach and carrots. But what they found out after evaluating all this data will blow your mind. Um, and, and don't quote me all these numbers, but they're close. Beta carotene, the worst carrot versus the best carrot beta carotene alone. You would have to eat 200 of the worst carrots to equal one of the best carrots for beta carotene. That's the variability we have in our food supply. Now, what agriculture has figured out is they figured out how to make them sellable to you that look nice on the shelf. They orange them or ethylene gas them or whatever they do to make them good to you but it doesn't, has no bearing on nutritional value. Not until you can taste it, bricks it, scan it, do you really know. I mean, some things you can look at and say, oh, I don't look very good, but generally speaking. 
So um, this is what, as producers, this is what you want, you want to be able to do, is you want to be able to produce that high nutrient dense food. Because there are people that will choose to pay $6 for a pound of carrots when I only need to eat one of them. Or $2 for a uh, grapefruit or a tangerine or an orange when they sell for 45 cents. There are people that will choose to do that. People like yourselves that say, you know what? I want nutrient dense food for me and my family and, and my community because it really truly is the best way to mitigate many of the health, chronic health problems we have today. We are notoriously mineral deficient. I mean, COVID is a prime example and I don't want to get on this for a thing, but you know, the research is out there. What do you take for COVID? What do you need? Selenium, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, what else is on there? Zinc. zinc, you know, which are notoriously zinc. Pro we have zinc problems there everywhere. It doesn't matter the crop. Zinc is a problem. We are not getting zinc into our plant. Um, and I'll, I'll put a blame here. And if there's a Monsanto rep and they want to shoot me, go ahead. Because I haven't been shot yet. But um, glyphosate, whether it's you putting it on or somebody put it on 15 years ago, glyphosate is a major culprit for trace mineral uptake into your plant. Even the 40-day half-life that they promised it had, it changes to the amino whatever protein, um, and it bounces back and forth between uh, Roundup and this a protein, and it chelates trace minerals. I don't think we have put enough emphasis on it because most people are afraid. They're afraid that they're going to get run over, and there's people, they've, there's been all kinds of stories. I can tell you stories about people that I know that have been bad and different herbicides, and. They, they seem to have a target on their back. So, um, it's a major problem. These trace minerals, specifically zinc, manganese, and copper. Um, it's a huge problem in getting the enough in our plants. So, um, selenium. Selenium's interesting in, in the human system because, um, first of all, it's not considered an essential plant nutrient. Um, uh, selenium is, nor silica for that matter, or nickel, or the other one. But um, if we didn't have it in our systems, if we didn't have selenium in our systems, we can't fight off. It's our, it's the flusher of our system. It's our liver. It flushes our system. It takes the excess aluminum out of our brain stem fluid and moves it back out of the system. But if you have a selenium deficiency, you're not going to take that out and then you end up with Alzheimer's or, or something like that. So um, I'll get off this thing. We don't need to go in there. I'm not here to beat up on anybody. Um, Nutrient dense food. That's this is where it's going, and this is what I teach all growers. Whether you're growing 2,000 acres of corn and beans, or you're a small home gardener, or you're trying to make a living as an urban farm, this is what's going to come down the pipe. Um, so you want to be on top of the game so that you can get seven dollars a pound for your tomatoes because they're truly worth it. Yes, it's <laughs> it's called the bio nutrient meter. <laughs> Uh, the, the organization Dan runs is the Bionutrient Organization. Uh, Bionutrient Food, thank you. Bionutrient Food. Bio, uh, his, uh, his website is bionutrient.org. All of the data. One of the beautiful things that Dan's done with this is all the data is open platform data. So if, if, if the chemical companies want to get involved, they can go access the data just like every one of us. You can go see the graphs of the spinach and the and the carrots that show um, you know 14 percent higher iron in the in the spinach and that was the the defi the difference in the in spinach the the, the iron levels 1400 percent different between the the worst and the best that's that's a lot of iron <laughs> you know um, so that's that's a tool that's that's coming down the pike and, and everybody should be uh, thinking about that not just to make more money because it's the right thing to do for your family, for your community, for your customer, for your client. And when you do this, and this, re this research is coming along with the meter, what they're doing is they're, is they're uh, paralleling the, the soil and the management program to grow this carrot. So you'll know if you have a 10 CEC soil and you're sitting in Georgia, 
there's data out there to say this is the program they did. This is not all together yet, but that's the ultimate goal. So you as a grower can say, you know what, I'm going to grow carrots and I want to grow nutrient dense and this is how they did it, this is how we're going to do it because our soils are similar, our environment's similar. So um, probably I've, I've, I've alluded this intentionally, but we, we need to talk about regenerative soils. Um, in order to be regenerative from a soil standpoint, what, you, your, what your plant, mineral, biological connection has to do is leave the soil better off than when you put it in the ground three months before, six months before, ten years before. That's the goal. What happens in these systems is if we can get this plant to photosynthesize at optimum levels and we pump these sugars into soil and we support diverse microbial systems, these microbes are the ones, the plant microbe connection is the carbon pathway. Uh, Dr. Christine Jones out of Australia, she named it the liquid carbon pathway. It's moving CO2, making carbon through microbial systems that they're pooping out and we actually build humus organic matter over the long haul. And that's, that's the regenerative part of, of doing this. Where we get to the point where we don't have to, all we do it ideally, we say it's utopia, but there are people doing it. We go plop the plant in the ground, we water it, make sure it's, you know, it's not getting dry, and we've got these wonderful fruits out of it. Is it utopia? It's not utopia. People are doing it, um, you know, successfully without putting on triple 19 or triple 10 or, you know, 15 gallons of fish or 100 pounds of composted chicken manure. There are people that are doing it with very little input costs. Emmanuel, do you want me to touch anything else? I mean, I could go into soil testing. I don't know what, maybe it's just a, maybe I should ask some questions. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't to be a sales, a sales. I'm here to educate, but I will, okay. Okay. Understood, understood. Um, there was a question right here, yes. Yeah. What's been your experience with solarization um, in consideration for bacteria and fungi after you solarize for a couple of months and crop production thereafter and crop health after solarization? Okay. Um, so there's a book out by Brian O'Hara, who's from Connecticut. Um, he just wrote the book. He, he, he would be, I would direct this question to him because I don't have direct data to support it, but Brian's been doing regenerative farming. Uh, fabulous, if you ever get an opportunity to listen to Brian, he, he works his way up and down the East Coast in the speaking circuit, and I can't think of the name of his book right now, but Brian O'Hara. Um, it's from Chelsea Green Publishing. Um, that's how he does all of his weed control methods, his solarization. Um, uh, he talks about it in his book. He does soil testing with us also. Um, so. That's, that's where I would go and, and look at his book and, and find out. Because there hasn't been enough research. You know, unfortunately, the big chemical companies are not supporting what we're doing. You know, I want to know in solarization, how bad am I, am I compromising my biological system? And uh, I mean, I've heard Brian talk about it in his presentations. He said, oh, uh, in the top two inches, I think if I write, Yes, you're going to nuke, nuke the top two inches, but really our microbial system is where our roots are, or were. So, you know, yes, we're going to have some bacteria up top, not much fungi, morally bacteria. Um, so go back and replenish it. You know, so I, I think one of the, the things that we, we have to get a grip on is there are ways to, to get microbes back into our system. I, I mentioned compost. You can make liquid extracts or compost teas. Um, are you doing any compost teas? Yeah, compost teas. Brad's doing compost teas. I got farmers all over the country and every crop you can imagine using compost teas. And they're just using it on a, on a every week, two week, three week basis just to replenish microbes again. It's, it's so inexpensive to do, it's like a no brainer. So um, if, we, if we use solarization as a tool, that's fine, do your solarization, rip the cover off, go put some microbes back on it, get a green plant back in there and away we go. So that's good. So, 
even if you can't purchase the best compost for your tea in the world, you're, you're buying a municipal waste compost or you're making verma, verma compost, which is typically going to be more bacterial, you need some fungi. There's fungi everywhere, we just got to go harvest it. So this gets into Korean natural farming concepts, but this is just uh, simple compost tea concepts. Um, because we don't know what all microbes we need, it's a living system. We're never going to be able to figure it out 100%. It's too dynamic. Um, so the concept is get the most diverse microorganism mix you can get and spray it or apply it. So what Emmanuel's talking about is uh, we looked at the, I think we looked at it biologically, did we not, through the microscope, and I said there's a lot of bacteria, not much fungi, so go find the forest, the wooded forest that's been in woods for a long time, it's naturally going to be fungi, take some scoops out of there and take it home with you. That's now an inoculum, that's a fungal inoculum, we know that because it's trees, that's what's going to function best there and add that to the mix. And then I would tell people, you know, if you can if you can stockpile wood chips that start the breakdown process, in that breakdown process, they're being broken down by fungi. So we could take some wood chips and throw in there. There's really nothing you shouldn't throw in there. We want, we want the kitchen sink, we want indigenous microbes from here, we want indigenous microbes from the forest that's a quarter mile away because they're all interacting in this in this microcosm that we have. And because we don't know, throw the kitchen sink at it. Let, let Mother Nature sort that out. Each plant has its own set of microbes that are going to function with the plant. And that could change based on the stage of growth of the plant. Blossom and reproduction could be different sets. They may, we don't know, they may change every day. We, we don't know that. We, don't, we aren't sure of that. Yes, too cold, too dry. Yeah, yeah. So that 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 leads to why we want diversity. We want diversity out there because we know when the soil temperature is 66 degrees and 7% moisture, a certain set of microbes is going to function. But when it changes to 70 degrees and 35% moisture, a new set of microbes is going to wake up and take over. That's the whole diverse diversity concept. We don't know. You know, we don't know. There, you can purchase biological inoculums that are basically the only microbes that we can culture. Uh, the Bacillus subtilis and Thuringiensis and uh, Pseudomonas and things. Those are things that we can culture and put into a jug or, or stabilize them into a dry form. But there's only so many right now. We just, some of these microbes you can't culture in a lab. They do not function. They try. They can't make them function in the lab. So, are we ever going to know every single one? Probably not. The current estimates right now is we know about one percent of our biological system right now, one to two percent. Um, and and when I started doing these these talks 15 years ago, they said in a in a teaspoon of soil there was. I don't know, 5,000 different species of bacteria, and now, now the numbers are, are millions. You know, it's just we keep learning and learning and learning. In that teaspoon of soil, there's yards of fungi in a teaspoon of soil, and that's when we talked about the root mass, when we can get these fungal networks growing in soil, um, you know, this tree is going to communicate with something all the way down there. It may be exchanging information, saying, hey, we got aphid attack down here, and down there, that plant will do something, uh, produce a compound to try to keep that insect or disease or whatever it is away. So the whole system functions together if we have things in place to do it. Okay, so the question is, uh, the last two years, extremely, extremely hot conditions. Um, what can you do to, to moderate soil? Um, I'm gonna say that we really wanna focus on the plant at that stage. And uh, soil's gonna, we aren't gonna be able to make a big enough change in the soil fast enough to, to moderate it. So we really have to keep that plant photosynthesizing out, protect that plant. So we use um, kelp. Kelp cytokinins is a, is a great um, uh, extreme weather tool. Um, even if it's, if it's gonna freeze, uh, you know, go out with a kelp seaweed product as a foliar, fish, sugar, 
anything to keep energy flowing to that plant. What that plant's wanting to do is it's saying, okay, I'm holding everything because I may die tomorrow. What we see in, in the leaves of the plant, we do a tissue or sap analysis, is we'll see the plant will hyper accumulate nutrients because it doesn't know when it's gonna breathe or respirate, respirate again or stop respirating. So, so we wanna keep giving that a little bit of, I'll say energy um, to keep the plant going through that, through that time frame. But I wouldn't focus on soil at that point. I, I will say this generically, um, keep your soil covered, you know, practice intercropping, put in a cover crop, put something in your cash crop right in with it because that helps moderate soil temperature. And there's research out there that a cover crop can save you five or six degrees. Well, five or six degrees can be huge in that situation. So, yes, you're welcome. Other questions? Mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, yeah, we could probably spend the next two days, well, I don't know if I have that much material on mycorrhizal fungi, but Mycorrhizal fungi is, uh, I just read an article, now it used to be 95% of all living plants and now they're saying 92%. So every 92% uh, of all living plants are, my, they can be, um, uh, what's the word? Colonized, yeah, symbiosis. They, they work with mycorrhizae. So the mycorrhizae, whether it's endo or actuo, actually either live in the root or they embed themselves in the root and they reach out. So mycorrhizal fungi um, is a uh, fungi that is really important for phosphorus solubilization. Actually, it's a bacteria that lives on the mycorrhizae that solubilizes it, but the, but the mycorrhizae pulls the phosphorus into the plant. And remember, mycorrhizal fungi can stretch I said there's, in a teaspoon, there's yards. We can stretch long ways uh, away from the host plant. Right now, I think the largest mycorrhizal network is like 2,200 acres or 22,000 acres out in Oregon. They've actually measured, DNA measured at different spots. So mycorrhizal networks can be huge. Um, they're the best um, resource for drought conditions. Mycorrhizal fungi can get into this pore spaces in soil that the root can't access. So uh, we, we see in, in um, row cropping systems, uh, when you compare a soil that's mycorrhizal colonized, colonized versus what's not in a dry system, it can be a six or seven percent or six or seven bushel per yield, uh, bushel per acre um, difference by having mycorrhizal colonization. The, one of the biggest problems, and I didn't touch on this and I should have from the beginning, is tillage. So if you think about all these strands that are running under our feet and reaching you know, here and probably outside the confines here um, is uh, tillage. So when we go through with our, you know, our DP or our Toro because it makes it fluff up and look beautiful, we're also committing genocide okay, at the same time, especially with fungi. Bacteria they can function through a lot of things, but fungi, they don't because we have all these long strands and all you've just done is, you know, when we used to have telephone lines before cell phone tires, uh, cell, phone, uh, cell phone towers, um, we just cut all those lines in a million pieces. Well, that, those, these two trees used to talk to each other. They used to share nutrients, share moisture with each other, and now you just severed that. So, and now it's survival of the fittest. You know, one of those trees is going to suffer some way, shape, or form. Um, another big problem in mycorrhizal uh, uh, that reduces mycorrhizal colonization is phosphorus. Excess phosphorus applied to soils, um, it basically just makes mycorrhizae lazy, for a better way, lack of a better way to explain it. Um, when you put a lot of phosphorus down on soils, this is what we see in agriculture, in conventional agriculture, they're putting their... Uh, 1152 DAP map whatever uh, phosphoric acid products down and their mycorrhizal okay so the question is um, in this type of production is as a mite enough to cover all your trace mineral needs so my generic answer is no because if I look at your soil test and that's really what I want to tell you is I need to see your soil test but typically in a soil test um, I'm going to do a recommendation, which is kind of what you were asking me to do. 
I'm going to do a recommendation. And let's say you have um, your borons at 0.8 uh, pounds. I'm going to do pounds per acre just because that's in my head. 0.8 pounds per acre. Well, our target for most soils is 2 and heavier soils is 4. There's not enough boron in the azomite to fill the gap. So azomite's not bad. It's a nice dose. But really, to fix the mineral balance, we need to have boron first and then use some azomite afterwards. So I would tell you to put on, uh, depending on your CEC, 10 pounds of borax soap to move my boron levels up. The beauty of azomite at that point is there's not enough to cause a toxicity problem, but you're also getting 91 other trace minerals that we don't even know what they do yet. So that there is value in, in um, azomites. Um, most of your mine minerals have lots of trace minerals in them. Um, concentrated seawaters, whether it's dry or, or liquid, um, C90, Grow Pal are a couple products out there, lots of trace minerals, but there's not enough of any one trace mineral to really fix a deficiency in your, in your crop. Can we band-aid it with that? Sure you could, but I'm gonna tell you, I want you to move boron up because in plant physiology, you can have 10,000 pounds of boron out in this acre. If, excuse me, 10,000 pounds of calcium out in this acre. If you don't have boron levels coming in the plant, you're never gonna get your calcium levels up. And then you're gonna call me and say, well, I've got blossom end rot on my peppers and, and my uh, tomatoes. Well, that's, a, that's not a calcium problem. You've got plenty of calcium, it's a boron problem. And that amount of azomite may not fill the gap. Yes. Right, and what crop are you growing? A little everything. Okay, okay, yep. So, so just a couple comments. So his question is, they've been, they've been using some chelated trace minerals. The concept of chelation is quite simple. What we're doing is taking this mineral, boron, manganese, zinc, whatever, and they chelate it, they put a claw around it with uh, typically an amino acid, a citric acid, something like that. Now the EDT chelation is a synthetic chelator. So I'm going to argue with you on this and I'm going to just tell you what my experience has been. I've worked with I've worked with blueberry growers who are using EDT chelated trace minerals and do sap analysis every 3 weeks with them and they're putting this on putting this on putting this on and we're not moving the needle. And then I say here I want you to try this that's chelated with amino acid or a citric acid or a humic or a fulvic acid and then we follow up with a tissue test and they go off the charts. So um, it, the, the challenge I think, and I'm not saying every EDT chelated mineral is like this, the challenge I think we have is number one it's synthetic. So I don't think the plant knows what to do with it and I, I don't want to get into plants know and don't know stuff but foreign material is foreign material, period. Okay. Um, there are some new chelation methods, IAS, is that ISO, Brad, ISP? There's some different chelation, what? IDS. IDS, IDS chelation methods, which I think are a little bit better, but I don't have research to tell you. So the benefit you're getting is you're seeing benefit out of it. So I'm not telling you don't do it. That's not saying that at all. You're seeing that when you put that foliar feed on there, or drip, or however you're putting it, you're seeing response in your plant. So obviously it's helping you. There's better ones out there, which then means less product, which is less cost out of your product, out of your pocket. So now I've got more profit at the end. And, and in reality, there's a whole nother concept here in plants, and plants and uh, all of us. And it's called energy. And this kind of, people get a little bit nervous when I start talking about these things. But everything is energy. Everything emits an energy. You're emitting an energy to me that I'm in, able to stand up here and not shake to death, you know, trying to talk to you. Because you're, you're confident and you're comfortable and you say, okay, I'm going to listen to this guy. So everything's an energy. So when we go out and foliar feed a 3% boron product at a pint per acre, there's not enough pounds 
of that product, parts per million of that product, to increase the biomass on that acre. I think in some of these, even in a chelated form, some of the times when we throw that energy out to the plant, it kicks the plant right in the butt and says, I want boron. And it goes and it tells microbes, microbes scurry, and all of a sudden we get boron uptake. So it's not all science there. I'm sure there is science, a scientist could argue with me, but it just doesn't make sense how you can take a pint of a 3% product and cover an acre worth of biomass and get the parts per million up in 35 minutes. It doesn't make sense to me. But Erica Reinhammer, who wrote the, co-authored the book with him, has an online calculator. So if you don't want to work with CSI and doing soil testing and want to just do it on yourself, which is fine with me, I don't make enough money on soil testing to, to pay the light bill. So um, um, they have an online calculator. You can actually take your results, plug them in into the online calculator, and it will tell you how many pounds of each mineral you need per thousand or per acre to do that. Or you can hire Ron and I to do it, whatever, whatever works for you. Uh, Steve Solomon, S-O-L-O-M-O-N, and Erica Reinhammer, and I think it's R-E-I-N-H-A-M-E-R. But if you just type in Intelligent Gardener, you'll, I mean, it's everywhere. But a great book. And so between those two books, it covers kind of what I talked about for the first 15 minutes. Mineral balancing, biological activation, balance, the whole nine yards. Um, I, I want to jump in and just, I think everybody's got a pretty good idea, but, but what we do is you send me a soil test, I send it off to the lab, we get the results back, we do the recommendations for both one, mineral balancing, so that's the important part. Most labs, most consultants are focused on one or the other. You say, oh, you need to go mineralize, totally mineral remineralize your soil, and not to knock the system, Neil Kinsey, uh, Kinsey Ag Labs, he's a very focused on remineralizing doesn't really focus on biology. Other labs are only focused on biology. We're taking both together, and then if that weren't enough to drive you crazy, then I wanna make sure that you're keeping that plant at optimal photosynthesis levels uh, throughout the entire growing season. And then we sell products, I have products to sell to help support that. Yes? Okay. Ron's been fortunate enough to sit and listen to me for five or six years, so he's heard all my stories. So um, this was this happened to be in the southwest corner of Michigan. Um, I was called in because, and this is 2006 or so, probably. Um, we were called in because they had gotten a uh, recommendation based on a soil test from the extension service. I'm not going to name names just to protect the innocent. But um, in the recommendation, it basically said apply 140 pounds of phosphorus, 100 pounds of nitrogen, something else, something else. Wait for a growing season and then start planting plants. And that was not what they wanted. This was a community garden. Actually, they rent out plots. Uh, so it's in the corner right uh, as we come across Illinois, Indiana, and then into Michigan. Everybody comes to Michigan, to the Lake Michigan. So there are people that typically had second houses somewhere on the lake but only had a lot this big and they wanted to grow their vegetables so they rented out these these plots 20 by 20 plots for the whole season they had rules about what they could do to their plot which involved no fertilizer they could not use fertilizer in the system so anyway um, i'm on the, on the process of uh, at the beginning process they call me in i go out and pull my own soil samples we did biological tests of them. We sent off for mineral analysis. It was the stinkiest soil I've ever, this, this is soil, I've ever smelled. It was, it was horrendous. It smelled, it almost smelled worse than sewer. And what it was, was um, some mucky clay with water. It was a swamp over this area. Water was running underneath it. And so, um, calcium levels were at, I don't know. Their, their base saturation was low. Phosphorus levels were non-existent. Um, just stinky mess. So we, they got their hands. I told them they needed carbon. I said we need to get carbon in the system, both to give us a little bit of opening up of the soil, some flocculation, some air movement, and we need some biology. 
And so, um, and I said, oh, by the way, we're going to start growing this year too. We aren't waiting for a year because you've already got these things rented out and you haven't got your beds built yet. So we put in uh, 16 inches of leaves and these leaves were in varying states of decomposition. It was a lawn care business that had stockpiled them for years and said, yeah, you can have all you want. We'll take them all. So we put in leaves that were 16 inches. I, I wasn't there. They actually came in with a tillage tool, which was against my better judgment, but we needed some way to get incorporation of this into the system. So they came in with a, a deep disc rip. It only ripped about 18 inches, 16 inches, something like that, where they actually cut up and turned in these leaves in the system. And then um, we started using compost teas. They didn't go into compost teas a whole lot, but um, we started spraying, oh, and one other thing. They put in one ton on the acre, 2,000 pounds of worm castings. So one ton on the acre is not really much. When you put one ton on an acre, you don't see it. I mean, it you know, falls in. But a nice biological inoculum, and then we started spraying teas on it. I sprayed tea four times. And if my memory serves me, um, did a soil test the following spring. Phosphorus levels were like uh, 34 pounds in the first test. They were over 200 in the, in the second year. Um, calcium went up, uh, it was almost perfect. I mean, it went up uh, and we really didn't add per se phosphorus and calcium and, and other of the nutrients came, came through too. But we really didn't do anything nutritional to the system. And, and they have, as, as far as I know, still to this day, a beautiful garden. Soil smells good now. When you pull the soil test now, but we got air to flow. There's still water underneath it. That's never going to stop. That's just part of geography. But we got the stuff above it to breathe and to function fine. So is that what you wanted to, I missed? Oh, phosphorus. Now it's now well. The last time I tested, which was probably 15, maybe 16, is now over 600 pounds of phosphorus. I have a blueberry grower, same thing. Blueberries grow, they're just like your soil down here. It's ball bearing, not ball bearing sand, but it's Lake Michigan sand. Um, soil organic matter levels are somewhere around 1%. And uh, I worked with a grower since I was, or uh, for the last, I think this will be the sixth growing season. His phosphorus levels when we started were 52. Um, just did the test, we haven't done this spring's test, but as of last spring's test, he's hovering about 590 pounds of phosphorus and we've added zero to the ground. We've added zero phosphorus, but we have improved carbon, improved biological activity. We work every year at getting these plants to photosynthesize better and voila, we find tons of phosphorus. I mean, especially in Florida, I mean, you're sitting on a phosphorus pit. So we don't have needs for phosphorus here. There's zero need for phosphorus. We do have to get biological activity going, specifically fungi, to help release the phosphorus because it's five different forms. We've got to get it in the right form. So fungi is really important in phosphorus release from the plant. So that kind of is a, in a nutshell, I'll be right there, uh, in a nutshell, um, what we do on our end. And then Ron and I talk to customers all year long, uh, you know, on everything you can imagine, what they're seeing in the plant, what they aren't seeing in the plant. They got insect pressure, they got disease pressure. Um, and we just try to help guide them down that pathway. A little bit about soil testing before I kind of conclude and go back to some more questions. Soil, yeah, I will. Um, soil testing is a tool. It's a tool. It's a map to tell me, to help you, how to get from point A to point B. Soil testing is, they're showing us a very small piece of your pie. It's not showing us the total nutrient profile, it's showing us a little bit. Don't get caught up in worrying about every single pound on your soil test. Because in every case, biology trumps chemistry. Uh, so the question is, have I had any experience with herbicides being translocated through manures? Um, and I'm going to be a little smart alecky when I answer that question, because that's how I function. Um, herbicides are in mother's breast milk. Herbicides are in mother's breast milk. Herbicides are in the uh, livers of bears. Bear, uh, polar bears. Um, 
Herbicides are everywhere. And it is, it is a problem bigger than I think we give it credit for. Um, so uh, the big concern right now is it's coming through compost. Um, one of the interesting things, and everybody's talking about glyphosate, about Roundup, you know, that's the big thing because there's million dollar lawsuits. And I, and I don't think that's alone. I think there's a lot of other herbicides that are maybe as destructive, but we don't have the data to support it at this point. Um, uh, neonicotinoids coming through compost, it's not getting broken down in the compost. Herbicides coming through the compost. Herbicides coming through the manure because the animal that ate the whatever forage, it's, it's coming through, you know, and, and, and I guess the, the mother's breast milk tells it all. I mean, every, every time they've tested any water from around the world, it has glyphosate in it at X parts per million. We're in a, we're in a very uh, compromised situation here. So all you can do is try to do your best to keep the nutrition up in your crop, because we know it's there. Focus with that particular uh, Roundup, the, the mode of action with that particular herbicide is it's a chelator. Roundup doesn't actually kill anything. It chelates manganese, zinc, and copper, among some other trace minerals in the plant. And the plant actually gets weak because it can't get those nutrients. And actually what kills the plant is fusarium, the soil fungi that's everywhere. That's mother nature's cleanup crew. We got a weak plant here, we kill it. Fusarium kills the plant, Roundup doesn't. Um, it's, it's just the mode of action, it's patented mode of action, of the, uh, it's, it's a chelator. So, Yes, it's everywhere. All we can do, I mean, I have growers that still use it. You know, all we can do is say, okay, what do we do to mitigate the problems that are becoming associated? Because now if I'm, I'm watching the crop from a nutritional standpoint and I see zinc, manganese, and copper deficient, well, guess what we're going to foliar spray to keep, try to keep the levels up there the best we can. Yeah, for every ton of chicken manure, there's a pint of glyphosate, even in organic chicken manure, been proven. So <laughs> if, if it, the organic chicken fed organic feed are still in a ton of it is one pint of glyphosate. It's, it's everywhere, just something we have to deal with. Take your zinc, take your manganese, eat your food that you're growing to get your zinc and your manganese because what do we just find out about zinc and COVID? You know, it's, it's the, we, we, we have, we have zinc deficiencies in selenium for that matter. I, I, okay, so his question was, how fast can we get soils functioning? Well, when, when, when a commercial grower contacts us or contacts any consultant, they aren't looking to wait five years to grow a crop. You know, they've either borrowed money, uh, somebody's invested money with them, they need to start producing a crop as fast as they can. Because of hydroponics, we can grow a crop without soil. We know how to do it. So even when soil isn't perfect, if you have the budget, we can side dress, foliar feed, overhead sprinkle, whatever, to keep nutrition flowing into that crop. Because if we can, that's the fastest way to rebuild the soil. You can't afford to put enough money in compost and biochar and humates to take a soil that's that arid soil and make it perfect in one year, you know. And I, I don't, nor I shouldn't say you can't afford. It. Everybody can afford it. Some people can afford it. It wouldn't be a smart way because really, this is the best way to build the soil. Uh, anything green in the plant, yes. And even if it's just taking and going and putting a cover crop out there, and even if it's just a prayer with a cover crop out there, try to get something photosynthesizing because that's the system. The system. That's the way the system. Mother Nature doesn't like bare soil. She's going to put something there. She's going to put something there that is going to help fix that soil. Plants are not haphazard. Weeds are not haphazard. Another good rule. Weeds are not haphazard. Weeds grow there because you've provided the condition for that weed to grow. Whether it's too much phosphorus, not enough phosphorus, not enough calcium, whatever. You know, everything grows for a reason and it's there to fix something. Even though it's a pain in the butt, it's there to fix it. Amp self hand for doing what you're doing. That's Okay, I'll be around. You're welcome to uh, thank you. Thank follow you. me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Right out of our garden. Yeah. 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 Y